Good morning, everybody. Welcome to what is going to be um, a, a video in which we're going to be looking at what I've done here with my multiplayer game. This is based off the five days we had earlier with the basic multiplayer flow in which we created a client in the server and those were communicating very simple message, uh, a chat message and a sample of player position. I'm saying sample here because um, you're going to see I totally rewrote the way those are handled instead of taking care of player position, I'm taking care of actor position, which could be anything really. Now, um, I need to preface this with uh, whatever architecture you're going for will depend on the game you're trying to create. And that goes for even deeper where you might want to do peer to peer. Who knows, this, this might not be the best suited method um, to do peer to peer. If you want to do dedicated server, this is where I'm going, like in my head, this is where I'm going, but also I want to make sure that a client can host on his own and have friend join him. Um, so I'll give you a brief overview of what I'm trying to achieve. I want to create a four player survival co-op game and um, anybody that wants to host his game, host his map, can do it and other people can connect to it. So that's what I plan on, on, on going for actually. And um, it's going well thus far. <laughs> I've been working on the project for a full week and a couple of days now. I haven't touched it yesterday or the day before just because I have other things to do, but let's uh, let's go through it. The video is going to be long form. I might be renting a bit. That's what I do. I'm sorry, but uh, you're just going to have to stick along with it if you want to see the, the technologies I've been using throughout this. So first overview of the project. I'll reboot it from start. Sorry about the weird sound in the background. It could be my dog doing stuff, but yeah. Um, initially, I have a screen that has a three options on it. Do you want to boot a server, a client, or both at the same time? So this is where if I have a dedicated client, I'm just going to choose this option um, through, not through uh, like this window here, of course, but I'll just boot it uh, headless. Um, a client will just choose client and a server and a client will choose both. So I'm going to go with the option server and client. I am um, technically connected to what I will be using as a game server. So at this point, we are connected with someone, that's a game server, but we still have a little bit of option to pick. For example, if you're a, a person joining the world that already exists, then you might want to be customizing your character or choosing a predefined character here. As you can see down here, I received keep live um, messages just to make sure that those do not disconnect through timeout. So I send a keep live every 20 second, 25 second, I believe, because the timeout currently is at 30. And I'll, of course, I'll be changing that in the future once I find out how. There's just no documentation on it at the moment. Um, but yeah, so I have a keep live. Um, when I enter the world, this is where information about my specific character will be joining. So, for example, if I have player B and player B played with me yesterday, he has like remains on his account. He has like a player position defined to him. He has customization for his own character. This is where he's going to be picking his own character and then the server when I hit enter world, we'll be sending him a message when he enters, and that's my net enter message, uh, enter world message. So in there, there's gonna be information about the player, what was your inventory, where were you in the game, and so on. Okay, now um, from this point on, the messages get quite messy for the sole purpose. I'm receiving both the server and also the client messages at the same time, but I'll just take you through what I currently have. Now that we've entered the world, I gotta show you a couple of things in here. Um, as I mentioned, the log is going to get quite messy. I do have a debug menu that you just see here. We'll go over that in a second. But what I wanted to show you first is this. So I have my game running here in the background. It says uh, run in background as well. So my server keeps on running even if I'm not focusing Unity. Same thing for the client. And then here I have another build in which I'm going to say I just want to have the clients and nothing else in which we receive the net welcome enter the world, we're adding a new entity, and as you can see, he's moving in the back screen here. Um, but I want you to, to see something here real quick, is that my player does not have, where the camera is, he does not have any mesh on his own. We're not, I'm not rendering the player at the moment, it's just like a little specification that I wanted. Um, but here I am with the other one, and he's moving around. What I wanted to show you is uh, the principle of radius detection, you could say. So. In, uh, in the game I'm trying to make, a survival game with a really big map, um, on that big map, I don't want to have information about the boss who's 300 kilometers away from me. That's way too far away. I don't want to have him in memory. I don't want to render him. I don't even want to know what's going on with him. So 
there is in principle here that every single net object that I call actor in my case, every single of these actor, they, they have a certain position in the world. So just like any unity object, they have a transform. Well, they don't really have a transform. They just have a position in the world compromise of uh, three floats. So X, Y, and Z. If I'm close enough to those, if the server thinks that I'm close enough to those, then he will send me information about them. And he's going to be sending me three types of information here. If it's the first time that I encounter this, this object, well, not the first time, but if it, it just entered my radius now, it's the first time that it's in my radius, then he's going to send me the full information about this object. What is his position? What's his mesh? What's his material? Everything like that. Um, the second one, the second information he could be sending me is, is that object, is that actor dropping out of my radius. So am I starting to lose sight of it and now I want to delete it? And then the third is an update. So I'll give you an example of all of them. And we'll have a look at my uh, my blue cube here, in the, I'm pointing in my screen, at the blue cube that you see in my background. If I go far enough, I'm going to drop out of sight. So right here, I, and as you can see, it, it works both ways, right? So I drop out of sight for one person, and the other person is also too far to get information on me. And when I drop out of sight, I send this message where my object is added in a list to remove. When I enter sight, I'm sending uh, the full information about this actor. This is why I'm able to spawn it with this color. Now we'll do a quick example here. I have this player over here, which is player, um, it's the last one that joined, so it would be player 1339. Uh, just for the moment, I've started my unique and that fire at the delete number, so everything after that is just plus one. So um, ID number 1339 is a new player. I'm going to change his color here because I have an interface that does that to maybe not, maybe two. Am I on the right color? Oh, maybe, maybe I'm the one that changed color here. Am I? Yeah, I'm the one that changed color. Okay, my bad. Um, so let's see. Let me go back here. 1338 is the player that I see. So this one. And I'll be changing the color of 1338 to 2, for example. So now he's red, right? And as I go out of sight from the first player, the red cube, I'm going to change the information of myself in this case to another color. So maybe, I don't know, I think this one is green. And as you can see, I'm not in sight of the other player. Yet, as I walk here, I get information on this completely. So the full information, including his collider, if there's any. Yeah, it's a, it's a sphere collider right now. It really doesn't show, but I can probably, yeah, I can jump on it, I believe. There's a small collision. I just don't know which one it is. Um, let me go look, actually. I have it right here. So for myself, this one, I have collider ID 0. I don't recall which one is this. It's probably a sphere. And then the option here is going to be 2 for the radius of that sphere. Let's see. Yeah, makes sense now. Yeah, it's a sphere, definitely. Okay. So as you can see, the information is being sent. That's a new object. All right, so that works. And as you can see here, when I change the information of the sphere, it it actually changed um, while I was looking at this thing. So I did not need to have a full new object sent to me. I could change it in real time. Uh, another proof of that is I can just go here and look at this. This is player number one, I believe, or number two. I don't know this one. I, I'm, I can actually change his mesh right here on the spot. And that information is fed to me directly right now. Um, and I don't need to drop and then get to see him again to, that to have that information. So um, it's a new message that I'm sending. And before what we had is something called the player position message. But in this case here, it's no longer the player position. I'm just going to close this up. It's actually another message, which is called the synchronized actor. And you'll see that I don't have many messages and I don't plan on having more. Uh, well, I do plan on having more, but not many more. So for example, if I want to cast a fireball, I don't want to have a message for casting a fireball and another message for casting a ice lance, for example. Um, everything is going to be a big cast spell and then everything beneath that will be what we're just going to be uh, when you send a spell, you're going to send in the spell ID, right? So something like that. Hmm. So on that message, I was talking about the sync actor, which replaces the player position. Those three lists are here. 
those are a list right now. I might want to change it for something a little bit more optimal. But as I'm creating this, I don't, I'm not really thinking about optimization just yet in the future, right? So three lists to add, to update, and also to remove. I initialize them. If I have a, if I receive that object as a, a data stream, then I'm going to deserialize my object in which you're going to see that it's a little bit complicated, right? So just like we were serializing things before, I do the exact same thing. I write the bytecode and then this is where it gets funky. Depending on how many objects that are new to me, I will write that count. So if my server tells me, hey, there is three new objects to add right now, I will write three. And then for every single one of these, I'll write the full actor. So I'll serialize the full thing um, depending on what I need, right? And then uh, number two here is when I update. Same thing, I first write the amount of things I need to update, then I serialize partially. And you'll see what that means in a bit. And finally, same thing here, how many people do I need to remove? And then I serialize remove. Same thing when I deserialize. I do have those debug.log that I don't need anymore. But uh, yeah, so I first start by reading the amount of bytes. So how many is there to add? And then I do a loop just for those and I deserialize those objects in particular. Now, this message here is, is, you know, it's a little bit complex, but it's easy to understand where it's a little bit more, uh, you could say messed up, is under the actor class here where I do serialize full, serialize partially, and then all of these that you're going to see. Okay. So I am going to introduce you to my serial, not serialized, but to my actor class, which is a big driving factor in the game. So it's a big class, but it's also going to be a big part of the game. So everything that is connected to the server and behave on the server will be part of that. As I mentioned, it's, it's an actor, right? So it's somebody that will take part in the game actively. It's not going to be in the static file. First, let me show you what I have. Initially, I have a flag here. Just take a sip of coffee real quick. It's a big one. Hmm. I have an actor flag. If you don't know how byte flag work, then that might not be the best place to start. But let me just do a quick example. Here you are defining a um, couple of flag that your actor could have. So you could say that those are all booleans and you could activate, hey, meta is equal to true, position is equal to true, visual is equal to false, and collision is equal to true, right? You could just imagine that. Um, and the way it works is that all of those value are unique, right? So if you decide to have a, a flag that is a, a, actually an actor that has the position and visual and collision flag, to give you a quick example, sometime I have an actor that I know is not going to move, that I know is going to, well, maybe he's going to have a meta, but his whole purpose is to be in a single spot that I predefine and have a visual and have a collision then what I plan on doing is just saying, um, hey, those are the only three things you need to look for, and those are the only three things you need to update in case they change, right? Nothing else. And in fact, if it's a static object that will never change, I'm just going to put it on none. And the reason why I would do this and have a flag like this is so I don't want it to be too heavy on the server. So if you have an, an actor object that is static and will never change, he's only there for a collision, like just to stay there and have a collision on the server side, then I don't want to have any of these. However, if it's a hmm, if it's like a wall that you can shatter, then I will give him the collision and maybe the visual flag. So when you shatter that wall, those two will change and will feed everybody else the information around it. So once the wall is destroyed, it's going to say, hey, my visual flag and also my collision flag will change. Therefore, I will send that information, that new information to everybody. Okay, so this is what the flag is here for. It's just there so I can determine what is going to be dynamic values. Yeah, that makes sense. I'm going to stop right there, <laughs> basically. Okay. Hmm. So as you saw earlier, my player, my player is under all right now. Um, it has all of these because I could be, I was able to change um, the information of the name, his position, uh, visual and collision. I could change all of that. So my player has all of these flags. First off, I have a constructor, empty one, and one with the a, a UID, because every single actor has a unique number, and that's going to be very important. So all of the actor 
have a have a unique number that is actually being assigned by something else. So the actor manager server, I believe. We'll go back to that in a moment. And now in a really, really ugly manner here, I have all the field that can be updated. So first, the unique ID. This one can't really be updated, but it's still there. Then I have the metadata um, flag, the actor flag. What are we looking for? We're looking to only track the collision in the visual. That would be here. Now the dirty flag is not to be updated, but it's to signal that, hey, on this frame, my collision change or my collision and visual change. So this is a flag that will be reset every time. But if the, the dirty flag is not set to none, so if there's something dirty, which means the data has changed, then those change will be pushed over to the server and everybody else around it will get the information. Then I have a fixed string for a name in case, I mean, it's metadata, so maybe sometime you want to give an object a name. Uh, I have three float for the position X, Y, and Z. Very essential for the radius check. I have visual for mesh ID and also a material ID. Collider ID, collider option one, two, and three. Um, quick note on those collider. I don't really use option two and three if it's a sphere, but for example, if it's a box, then I use one, two, and three for the scale of that box. So X, Y, and Z local scale. Uh, it really just depends, but I need to have these three there just in case. Okay. Now, once I have all of these, I start tracking for the previous information. So those are all just information about what I had previously. So what was my last flag? What was my last name? What was the position? Well, actually, what is the position tick rate? So how often do I update? And I decided to put that on an actor basis in case I have some slow moving object that don't really need to be updated that often. Um, last position, Y, X, and Z. Last mesh IDs, blah, 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 blah. So all of these basically. And what I do is every single frame that those are active, I look for the following. Hey, do you have the flag that I should be looking for? Actually, I'm going to rephrase this. Should I be looking for any update on your meta? Or should I be looking for any update on your position? Should I be looking for any update on your visual? For example, if I have the flag to check for position, then I'm going to go in here and say, oh, this one is a little bit more tricky. Let's start with the uh, visual. Is my mesh ID not equal to the last mesh ID or is my material ID not equal? If that's the case, let's actually put them on the new values and let's add our dirty flag, the visual tag. So now on the next frame, when my, uh, my server goes around and sees this object, he sees that he has a visual flag that is dirty. He's going to be taking this object and putting it on the to update of everybody and um, sending that over. I said that position is a little bit more funky, but simply because I don't want to update every frame, but I want to give it like a small buffer. So what I do here is if the position doesn't change, you just don't send anything. But every 0.5 second, check if it changed. Something like that. Collision is the same thing and meta is the same exact thing. So you see there is a lot of code that is being copied and pasted, but as I mentioned, maybe I don't care so much at the moment. I'll care a little bit later on. Okay, then the next big part here is the synchronized actor. Um, this is actually called on the client side, right? So what what happened is when I have um, when I have up, uh, updates to look for, when I have a new actor that join, I receive a actor as part of the synchronized message. So here on the sync sync actor here, those are a list of actors. So you know, those are pre-constructed. I know what is the information. I just need to update it. I just have to synchronize it with my um, with my client. So I go under a sync actor and I say, hey, if you have the dirty flag for Meta, then go ahead and change this. And then go ahead and change this, blah, blah, blah. Go ahead and change all of these in case you have the dirty flag. And now we'll get into the complex pod, which is not really complex. You'll see that those are split in two. I have the serialize and also have the deserialize. Um, the serialize taking a data stream read writer and the uh, deserialize taking the data stream reader, of course. Now, what happened is when I want to serialize a full actor, so uh, there's a new object that just joined like completely right there in my face. It's a new object. I want to write everything. I don't really use this one. I'm going to be frank. I don't use this one because it's not efficient, but I was using it at first. So what I do is I just write the dirty flag all. 
So I just say that every single thing is dirty and you need to update everything which will mean that afterward I have to serialize my ID, my meta, position, collision, and so on. I'll show you how, how it actually looks like. Um, just that. So you just write those values that you have. It's as simple as that, right? Hey, what's up, boy? Um, where I am a little bit more proud, like this one I don't use anymore, I don't think so. But where I'm a little bit more proud is where I do serialize partial actor where I say, hey, do you have anything dirty? If that's the case, yeah, well, write the ID anyway. You'll need the ID no matter what. But then you check for the dirty flag. So if only the position has changed, I'm only writing the ID and the position. If only the visual, only that. Or if both of them, then this happens. There we go. Um, yeah, same thing when you deserialize. So I'll just show that as well. I first read the dirty flag. I need to know what is it to update. And it's not just that. So the reason I, I am not just deserializing the whole thing here is because when I write those message, when I write those update message, um, if I only had the position in a visual update, then I just have a set amount of bytes to look for, right? So I'll give you an example. Here I have three floats, so eight, um, eight, 16, 24. I have 24 bits to read plus a visual, uh, two more bytes, so can't do math. 32, 48, right? I have 40 bits to read here, not bytes, 40 bits. And this is what I've written. And then afterward, if there's another object, then I'm starting to write for that other object, which might have a meta position and visual. But um, here, when I deserialize, I need to know that there's only these two things, right? So through the dirty flag, I know that I only have to check for position and visual, which means that I'm only going to read 40 bits, and then I'm going to stop, read another object completely. If those two get out of sync, your message will get corrupted and you're going to start having crazy results. So it's really important that you stay on, on point with the bits you're reading. Like if you know you only need 40 bits for this one, then don't go further than that. If you read after the buffer, then you're going to get some, some very awful surprise. Okay. I think we're good. I also have these two. Well, I could show you the serialize remove. All I do when I remove an object is just write his ID. It's as simple as that. The reason is, you know, when, when the, a person, not a person, once an actor is ready to get disposed, we just need to have his ID and then we flush him out of the system completely. Hmm. Okay, moving on to what could be the next thing we could be looking at. The actor the actor manager. The actor manager is a simple class in which I have a list of actor. It's a dictionary, not a list, with their ID and also a actor associated with it. Now I have two scripts that derive from that, a server and a client. Those could have been, like they did not need to inherit from actor manager, but I wanted to have a debug, the one that you saw earlier, so the debug screen that you saw. Um, I wanted to have to I wanted that to work for both sides, so both for my client and also my server. So I wanted to have like a base object I can look at, and this is that base object, right? So I'll start with the server. On the server, I have a couple of things. I have a UID counter, which I said I started at 137. I don't need to. I just wanted to see difference uh, from zero, so any number here will work. Um, actually, zero is the best number here, so you don't go through the buffer as as fast as you could technically. I have a view distance square, so this is actually the, the radius check I was talking about. Now, it was not 100 meter in the game because this number is square. You want to square this number because the operation to square is much more efficient than finding the real distance. Uh, because if you find the real distance, you'll need to do a square root and that's very expensive on the computer. Nothing new here. So, for example, if you want to do 50 meters, then just do 50 times 50 and... Sorry about that. 50 times 50 and then you uh, input that number and that's going to be 50 meter for your radius check. So um, an, actor, an actor is only going to have information about that radius around him. This is also going for, in my case, it's also going for a vertical axis uh, because I do plan on having multiple layers of the game, maybe like play in the sky and play under the earth, something like that. So I also want to keep track of that distance bubble. Okay. And I have two lists. Those are a list of actor. Actually, it's a dictionary that has an actor in a list of actor. 
and then another dictionary that has an actor and also a network connection. Here there is most likely room for improvement, but right now this is what I have. I do have another list just for things to remove because I need to fill it in and then remove it from all the other lists. I'll give you the reason why I have this right here. So I have a reference to my player actor and this is what, what I use as a key. And every single of our player actor will have a list of actors. So those are all the actor available to that specific player. So if I'm, I'm on the left side of the map and another of my friend is on the right side of the map, we don't have the same radius. We don't have the same objects to look for. It's not because he's on the right side and I need to have information about all the player and all the NPC he's fighting on that side of the map. I just need to take care of my own and I need to know what's new to me and what's getting removed to me. But, you know, we don't need to synchronize that. If we're on the same spot on the map, then sure, it, those are going to coincide, but no need to do that otherwise. Okay, then uh, I just need to have a network connection. This is for end link disconnects, I think. I don't actually know where I'm using it. Uh, whoops. Oh yeah, of course, I'm using it somewhere quite important. Um, we'll get there in a second. So. Uh, initially, I first register events, and when I shut down, I unregister events. What is the initialize? This is when I, I boot my server. So basically, when I launch my exile server, I also call the actor manager dot initialize here. Again, we'll go back to that in a moment. I know there's a lot of code, but uh, it's quite cool. So I call register events. I should technically not need to call the shutdown, but I have it here just in case. Now, what does register event does? It registers all the events I want to listen for in my world, actually in my actor manager. Now here you'll find utility.sSyncActor and also um, unregister event is the same thing, but you remove from that event. This is something that has changed quite a lot since um, we recorded the last five episode. And again, I'll go through that in a bit. Let's just finish what we started. <laughs> But just imagine that this is what is being called when I receive the message. So when the client sends me the message, the synchronized action, uh, sorry, synchronized actor message, I received this thing and then it calls the following function on sync actor, which is right here. Okay, cool. So when I receive a new message, um, technically when the client sends me a synchronized actor, the only thing that the client can can change is himself. So the only thing that the client can change is his position, his collision, well, maybe not his collision, unless he crouch, I guess that could be something. Um, but basically the information he's sending is only about him. I don't want the player to be able to send any other information about other person. So for example, my player should not be able to edit the way your player is looking like. So uh, through that logic, everything that I receive on the server side, everything that I received through this message is just one player updating himself. So that's why I take this player and I put him in the update list. So to update zero. Do I need anything else? I don't think so. So I just put him in the update and then I send, well, I don't send anything, but I do the synchronized actor. Good. All right. Let's go back a little bit so I can show you how the radius check work. Um, I have some utility function here in which I create empty actor. Just, this is just the uh, the blue ball you saw at the beginning is created through this. It's just I wanted to have an actor that just is an object that sits there that isn't the player. And uh, that object has uh, collider zero, I believe, which means he's a sphere and then collider option one, which means he has a radius of one. Uh, and then I finally add this actor to my list of actor, which I have another function for that. When I do create a player actor, it's the same exact thing, but I assign it a certain name. And I also add those player or well, the player actor in his connection to a list of connection. Then of course, add player to my list. When I add player to my list, I just do the UID counter plus plus. Okay. When I remove player, I look for that player. If I find it, I remove it from all of these things and I add it to the to remove. And the reason I add it to the to remove is because I need to tell other people. So right, 
uh, the player is leaving the server, but I need to mention everybody that the player is leaving the server. So I'll be adding it to their to remove list as well. Oof, it's getting a little bit complicated. I, hopefully you're tagging along. If it's if it's like too messy, we can do a live stream about it. Maybe just let me know in the comment section down below. That'd be cool. Hmm. I haven't streamed in a while because I'm quite bad at it. Okay, so. In my update actor, so this is being called every single frame, I believe. If I go under my server, let's see if it's in the update loop. Actor manager dot update actor. This is in my update loop of the server. It happens every single frame at the moment. Where was I here? Um, I first update every single actor that I have. So this is this is the update on the actor. This is what I had earlier. So if those actors have specific flag, look for um, changes on them. So this player change or th this visual change. If so, just set the dirty to one. Now, whether or not those changes are going to be controlled through somewhere else. For example, if my player is an N not my, player, my actor is an NPC and he moves around, that's going to be controlled somewhere else. But every time that I update on here, it's going to notice that the position has changed and therefore we'll send that to everybody else. Okay. And then I have the function right here for every single of my player. So this could be up to four, one to four. I do something called a send player radius, which should we get into that? Yes, we're going to, well, actually, before we get into that, let's just keep on going here. Um, and then once I'm done sending that information over to everybody who it, who has changed, who didn't change, who got removed and so on. Uh, then I just make sure to reset the dirty flag on everybody back to none. And finally, I clean up my to remove list if I had somebody to remove in there. Okay, now the magic happens in here. And it goes like this. We first start by grabbing the player connection. So this is my network connection. This will be required when I send over my message. Wait, and then I create myself a message just in case I need to send it. Now for every single actor in the whole map, what I do is I take a distance, the distance between that actor anywhere in the map and my player position. This is my player actor. So player.key is the actor actually. So player.key, as you can see here, the key is an actor. Um, I grab his position, my actor position, my player actor position, the position of this random actor from anywhere in the scene and and before before you're gonna say that this is not optimal I'm gonna say yes I do know <laughs> eventually this is gonna be part of a cell system in which instead of looking for anywhere in the map I'm gonna be looking at specific cell which the player is nearby to but at the moment that's not the case um, if the distance is below the view square distance so if it's in my view distance I first start checking, do I have that in my list of actor that I'm currently inside of? And um, if that's the case, let's check if the, is that actor dirty? Because chances are that it's not, right? If I'm looking at the sphere we had in the middle of the, the playing field earlier, so... Teddy boy? I'm being visited. So if I'm looking at um, this sphere here, initially it's a new actor but then nothing changes on it, so I'm not receiving information from this one, which means that right now there is literally no message being sent from the server. So nothing new except the, uh, the stay alive. So if that actor is not dirty, then we, we don't really care, right? So we're, we're not sending the information, but if it is dirty, so if it has one of the value that we're looking for that has changed, then in that case, I'm going to say, hey, let's add it to the to update list. Okay, and now if it's not part of the list that I'm currently seeing, and it's now in my radius, then I'm going to add it to the to add list. Pretty cool. Okay. Um, so I do two things here. I add it to the message I'm going to be sending, but I also add it to uh, the list of things that I'm seeing right now. So uh, next round or the next frame, I know that he's part of the list and I don't need to add it to the to add instead it's just going to go in here and check if it's uh, if it's dirty next up we have the else statement here so if it is not part of the list actually if it's not part of the view distance square so if it is outside of my radius and 
it was in my list but now it's outside, then I need to add it to my to remove because I want to remove this thing. It's outside of range, I don't want to be able to see it anymore, I don't want information on this object anymore. So you remove it, as simple as that. Okay. Then right after that, uh, I'm looking at if anything despawn server side. Um, so in case I am in radius of, for example, the ball, and then the ball get destroyed somehow, and it just gets removed from the server, or a player is next to me and that person um, leaves, then I need to know these facts. So this is why I do a to remove on the player. So if anything despawn, I need to add it to the player. And I just realized there is a problem with this logic. No, there's no problem. Sorry, my bad. I, I was thinking that what if uh, the player disconnects far away from me? I don't have any information on him. But here I do a check initially. Is that player, actually, is that object that disappear? Is it in my player radius? If it is, then let's add it to the to remove and let's also remove it from the player list. Okay. So if there's any of the object that needs to be updated, whether that's an update, a add, or a remove, then I'm going to be sending in my server, Oscar, I'm going to be sending it to the client, uh, the message that we've made. So send to client with the connection that I had earlier, and the SA is the synchronized actor message. Oof, okay, quite a big one. What should we tackle next? Uh, we could be tackling what happens when I receive it on the servers on, on the client side, or I could be tackling the way we send messages. Um, I'm going to keep the way we send messages to the last thing, actually. Okay. So now on the way that I receive those messages, I have a list here of what I call actor client. Bad name, I know, but basically those are the interface in between um, client and the Unity game engine. So those are engine specific things. Those are things we're going to be looking inside of the game. Those are game objects, those are colliders, mesh filters, all of that. Um, so those are actor client. In fact, you know what? Let's open it up real quick. In my actor client, once I create an actor client through the new keyword and not, not through mono behavior, um, I create a game object and I keep a reference to that game object somewhere here. I don't know why it's down there, but let's move that up. I tend to have those right beneath the constructor usually. Um, so this is what happens. I create a new object, totally fine, through a prefab at the moment that is inside of my resource folder, if it's a player. But if it's not a player, I just create an empty game object and I give it the name of that game object. Oh, sorry, that actor. I keep some information here, as you as you uh, saw earlier, regarding the meta, regarding the visual, collider. I keep all of that in here. And when I need to update those, so when I receive the to update call, then what I do is I call the appropriate update. So if it's a position, I take the transform that position and I move it. If it's a visual, I look, is there any filter on it or mesh render? If there's not, add it and then change it to a specific thing based on what I need. Um, my, I basically have a list of uh, resources and there is mesh in there and also materials in there. Uh, if it's a collider, it's a little bit different because I wanted to tackle my own collision. And when I mean that, I don't want to say that I'm not going to be using the uh, the Unity's collision system. I will, but um, all the collision that are, you could say, server side logic base. It's really hard to say, but uh, like spells, right? When you're going to be casting spells, uh, the collision of those spells will be tackled on the server side. Those will need to be really deterministic. They can't really. I don't want them to be hacked. Uh, those are important collision check and those are going to be using simple colliders all the time. So that I think I can handle. We'll see that in the future. Maybe I'll need to revert back to the Unity one and run Unity in the background. Who knows? But at the moment, I'm pretty confident in being able to create my own system with very simple colliders such as the sphere, box and also capsule. So that's all I'm using right now. Nothing else. Um, and I have those here, right? So zero is sphere, box one and capsule is two. That's how it works. It's as simple as that. Um, just a quick note before I keep on going. When I mention uh, I'm not going to be using that for the whole thing, just for the important collision. You know, like if uh, if you decide to have something explode, I don't technically need to see the rubble of that thing on the server. Like two person can see where the rubbles are in th at different places. I don't mind if they're not synchronized. 
So I would be using the Unity Collision system for that, for example, because they don't need to be synchronized. But uh, for spells, for abilities of the player, for maybe moving platform, those will all need to be done through the server. That's what I think at least. Okay. Feel free to give me any comments that you have. Uh, maybe I might be shooting myself in the foot. Who knows? I'm quite new to this. Uh, now, depending on which case it is, uh, which case it is, if it's case one, then switch the size of the blah blah blah, and then if it's case zero, uh, radius, and so on. So those are really determined on specifics to those. So sphere collider, box collider, and also capsule collider have different use of the collider option one, two, and three. Okay. So this is what the actor client is. A lot of work needs to be done here, obviously, but now you have an idea of what uh, I'm doing. Okay. Um, let's see here. When I enter the world, I receive the enter world message and I initialize my actor manager client. So this is where I'm going to be sending a little bit more information very soon. But right now, all I have is the world, actually the server is telling me what is my actor ID. And that's where I, I get this information. I get it in my... In my um, enter world message, which is the first message I receive when I join. And then just like we had earlier, we have a register events, which points towards a function that register the synchronized actor and also uh, unregister removes it. On synchronized actor is going to be a little bit different here. As you saw, uh, we first received that message. Now do remember, we, we just packed this message on the server side, it contains actor that we need to add, remove and also update. And for every single one of these that I need to add, update or remove, I have a specific function that uh, that I call with all of these. So yeah, let's have a look at this. When I create myself an actor, I first look, is this my actor? If it is not, then um, I create a normal actor client. But if it is, then I send in uh, a parameter here, which what is it exactly? What is a as an actor for Oh, for the object I'm I'm getting actually, <laughs> uh, and I add it to the list. I call on actor change to receive the changes here. And as you can see, if the flag is dirty for meta, we update it. If the flag is dirty for collision, we update it. If the flag is dirty for position and it's not my actor, um, then I update it. If the visual, same thing for the visual. If it's not my actor, then um, I don't want to update the visual. So this is very specific because, for example, if I move and I'm on the server and uh, we're not we're not on local host, right? So if my server is somewhere else, I move, I send information about my position. Uh, then like one second later, I receive feedback from the server that said, hey, I just re like, you just sent me a message about your position. I acknowledge that your position was at zero X, but now I kept on moving and I'm at one X and I receive that information back. Uh, the system is going to try to move me back. So I don't want that. If it's my actor, if I'm the one that's moving it, I am not to update the position and I am not to update the visual in this case. And that's it. Yeah. If I remove it, I just completely destroy this object. I do have a function that destroy the game object here, as you can see. Uh, and I remove it from both lists. Now, what else do I have to look for? I have to look for the update actor here. Um, if my actor is not null, and I do this check in case um, I haven't really received the information, if the actor fires before my initialize, uh, then I need to check is my actor null. If it's not null, synchronize the position and call the update. The update, as you saw earlier, whoops, it's uh, it's the update that we have on on actor check. So, boo -boo. here, right. So if something changed here, then go ahead and uh, make the dirty flag, right? And if the flag is dirty for one of these things, then we create a sync actor message and we send that over. That's the message that only contains one single actor in the to update, nothing else. That's what we mentioned earlier. And do know that everything here on the client side is really just looking for my actor dot update, not anybody else, just myself. Uh, phew, what else? If I want to synchronize the position, I grab the prior transform. If I don't have it, I find it. This is only going to happen once technically or twice if I leave the game and then come back. And what I do is I just put my actor position equal to my transform position. And that's it. Okay. Quite a big, uh, quite a big flow thus far. 
hope you're still with me. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I lost like 50% of the people or more, probably more. Um, what I'm going to go through next is the way that messages are being sent, actually. So, whoops, no, I'm not trying to attach the debugger, thank you. What I'm going to go through next is um, the actor client and also the not so client, so the server, right? So I'll open up the base server that we had earlier and also the base client that we had earlier. And you'll see a little bit of difference here. I, I changed the IP address to be something that you can parse with the port on there as well. Um, and what I wanted to show you is update message bump. So here on my update message bump, um, I don't quite remember what we had earlier, but what happened is that we were calling, um, we were writing the operation code right in here, I believe. And now this changed a little bit. I'm starting to use something uh, that I call the utility class. And inside of my utility class, I keep my operation code. But not only that, I put the all on data in there for both sides. So this is being called on both the server and also the client. So here, utility on data, same thing for the update message bump on this guy. So you utility on data, um, and then I send the server in this case. Yep. So on the client, I don't send the server, but on the server, I send the server. And here you can say base server is equal to null. That's the default, which is totally fine. But when it's the server, it's not, oh, it's not null. So what happened is I just look for the operation code, just like we were doing earlier. And then I find um, which operation code it is. And I create a message accordingly. If the, if the server is not null, I know that uh, this is received on the server and I send that as a server. I also send the connection that has been sent form. Um, else I just do receive on client. Now, uh, those are the two functions that were part of every single message earlier, which is totally fine. This stays the same. Uh, where it changed, actually, why did that close? There, go back. Uh, where it changed is down here. And now I have a list of action for every single message that I have and those match. So C welcome and also S welcome. Those are action with the net message in them. But if it's a uh, message that are meant for the server, then I also send a network connection because sometimes you need to receive that connection to send a message back to that very specific, uh, very, very specific person. Sorry. So oh God, I'm starting to get, uh, mm. starting to get speechless. I spoke a lot. Um, quick example, if I am buying a weapon at the merchant in the game, I am going to be sending a message that says buy weapon to the server. And then the server will need to acknowledge that and remember who I am because he needs to send me a confirmation that it worked. And with that confirmation, then on my client side, I can do like, I can play a sound and tell, Hey, it was a successful transaction. So I need to know who sent this message. So well, first I can take um, appropriate action on who's getting, getting the weapon and who's losing the gold. And then I can send him back a message and to send him back a message, I'll need to have a network connection. So <clears throat> sorry about that. Um, these actions are just here to exist. And then if you need to know like that somebody entered the world, or if you need to know that something happened, uh, you can subscribe to them, which is what we saw earlier with the register action. Now, um, those are all things that are, I could say, that um, are going to be part of every single server I have in the future. But then where it changes for this game specific is under the exile client and also the exile server. Um, those inherit, obviously, from those two that we looked at, and it changed a little bit. So for example, when I start the exile client, I want to register to these two messages. So ex uh, enter world and also exit world, which here things happen. If I receive a message to enter world, then of course, let's enter the world. If exit, then of course, let's leave. That's pretty much it. Actually, <laughs> if I'm in the world, let's update the actor client. Um, and then as well, the server, same thing. So initially I register my events in the initialize. Here, I also spawn some map actor. This is for the, um, the random sphere that you see in the middle. I just wanted to have something in there, but I could be defining different places where the actor would spawn. For example, 
if I want the sphere to float, I could say that, um, and it would float, right? That just is just manipulating what I currently had earlier. Um, and then if I keep on going, I send the keep live and I also update all the actors. But register events, as you can see, if somebody sends me a welcome message, a enter world message or exit world message, they're all being, um, actually I don't have a shutdown here, but they're all being uh, tackled in the following three function. So I send the, mail, the, the message back to this person, the welcome message back. Same thing here, I send the enter world message back, but then on top of that, I also give him his actor ID, because that's a new player joining, so I want to give him his actor ID. And if he exits, I just remove him from the game. I think that's it. I've been recording for an hour and 10 minutes. The video is probably not one hour and 10 minutes, but I messed up quite a lot, and <laughs> I just got pushed in the ground by the sphere. But as you can see, the sphere was there, at least it was floating. Um, let's try if I can move. Yep, I could move. So yeah, the position changed because I changed it on my server. So what's going to happen next um, in terms of this is the next step I'm going to tackle. I've been thinking about it and I think it's going to be to associate everything that I see in this map with a save file. So when I initialize the world, maybe I want to have like a data regarding this world. Um, because I was thinking about doing the inventory and stuff like that, but that's going to be all stored on a single file that will be called the world, right? So the world data will have information about the player, the player will have information about his inventory, stuff like that. Uh, that's where I'm heading next, I believe. And of course, if you like that, if you'd like to join me in that journey, then I'll be, uh, I'll be glad to share it with you. And uh, you just need to subscribe. And let me know in the comment if you do want to see that kind of stuff, because... Uh, I'll enjoy making it, even though I am losing my voice. Okay, that's pretty much it. I'm going to wrap this up. Um, goodbye, everybody. Pepe is also saying goodbye. Hi, ah, boy. No, he doesn't care. He's sleeping. I'm sorry. Um, I'll see you guys soon. Cheers.